So here I am with my friend, John Claude, who happens to be uh, my mentor, my inspiration from when I was young. And uh, this is, uh, I don't do many interviews, but this is a pleasure to be here with a, somebody I consider a friend. Thank you, Danny. I'm very pleased that uh, I'm the guy, the man of your first interview. Fantastic. Thank you. What an honor. You know, you are my friend. I cannot say you are my mentor because I'm so much older. <laughs> Although a young guy can be a mentor. And you know, my son somehow helps me a lot. And I've taken many decisions in my business at Hublot, many decisions at Tag Heuer because of a young man that was between 12 years old and now he's 15. And can you imagine? And when you listen to young people, it's the only way to stay young. And if you can learn, if you can listen, if you can look at, you will never become old. You seem to have business and life, and life and business. How do you measure? How do you balance the I, two? I don't need to balance because all is in one. My life is my love, and my life is my passion. And my love is my family, and my passion is my job. And that's my life. My life is my family and my, my passion. What else could it be? Sometimes my doubt. But the doubt is your friend because it helps you to readjust. So uh, uh, I have this enormous privilege, and I always teach it to the young students. Come on, guys. Try to make your daily job being your passion. Yes, sir, Mr. Beaver, I have no passion. I say, how old are you? 21. I say, that's normal. Are you married? Uh, no, you see, you, don't, you have not yet found the right love. So at 21, it's normal you don't have a passion. Mr. Beaver, how do I find a passion? <laughs> I say, this is very individual. But you all need, everybody needs to find a passion. One element, curiosity. If you are curious and you look at roses and you see a red rose and a yellow rose, did you ever ask the question, why is one rose yellow? And the same rose, same size, same shape. The other one is another color. Did you ask yourself? Uh, no. You see, because of a lack of curiosity, you don't ask yourself the question. Because of curiosity, I found a passion in watches. And I have now been 40 years in this business, and 40 years my, my life has been my passion and my family. Well, one thing's for sure, you do have passion. Because <laughs> I sit here and I'm ready to go <laughs> and motivated. No, but I, I walk around Basel and I've gotten to hear everybody has a different view of luxury. I hear this is luxury, that's luxury. So I wanted to ask you, John Claude, what, what do you consider the word luxury in oh. your mind? I have, to, I have to select uh, what do I consider in life luxury and what do I con consider luxury in business. In life, it's very easy, I said it already. In life, luxury is health and love. <laughs> if you have health, if you are healthy and you can receive love and you can give love, you are in luxury. <laughs> this is paradise. When you live in love, and when you are healthy, you are in paradise. So that is luxury for my private life. Now, professionally, I think you need a few conditions. Condition number one, luxury should be linked with eternity. Should be linked with something that never disappears, because if it is linked with eternity, then it is linked with love. Any product, that doesn't, be, that doesn't get obsolete 
as time goes on. Every product that can be repairable, a classic car from 1961 or 67, or a watch from uh, 1895, if it can be repairable in 100, in 1000, in 10,000 years, that is bloody luxury. Condition one, eternity. Condition two, quality. It must, and that's also one of the reasons it cannot last 10,000 years if there's not a quality behind. Quality. Condition number three, it's the wearer. If people who wear the product are giving the stamp of luxury at the end to the product. If you have a product that nobody wears, a car that nobody drives, if it's luxury maybe for you to be able to make a car that nobody buys. <laughs> That's a great luxury achievement. But luxury comes also from the wearer. If suddenly, uh, 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 not an expensive watch, let's say a watch costs $4,000, which is already expensive, but compared to the average price of the Swiss watch industry, it's still okay. If suddenly everybody wears that watch, if every president, if every important uh, 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 economist, if every important uh, billionaire, millionaire, if the Pope, uh, the, uh, if everybody starts to wear that watch, then these people who wear it, they are testimonial, they say this is luxury because all the rich people wear the watch. So luxury is also determined by the end consumer. And if the end consumer, and that is the typical Rolex problem, uh, problem, that is typical Rolex, all the important people have worn Rolex. Certain have not, but the majority f since so many years, and they have given to Rolex luxury. It's a transfer. Uh, it also happens for, for Batek, it happens today for, for Hublot. Uh, it's not only Rolex, but Rolex is the most spectacular uh, example that people who wear are giving you the stamp of being a luxury product, provided you work for the eternity, provided you have the quality. Okay, so now I wanted to ask you, because a lot of times you see everybody running around, young people, and they seem like to have the creativity, to have the passion, they're scared, they've been taught, don't make a mistake. Don't risk, because yeah. you could lose your job. What would you tell that generation or those employees about making mistakes? I would tell them that I'm sorry for their bad education. Because that's an education. People educate their kids to be perfect. People dream about kids, what they have not got by themselves. So they want children to be better than, than themselves. And people uh, uh, think that you can succeed without making mistakes, which is impossible. The mistake, the failure, is the step to go up to success. You need failures, you need risks, you need challenges. You need to be entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is somebody who has a vision. How can a vision be right if you are not God? Impossible! Impossible! I cannot see, I cannot know what will happen in five days. How can I do that? Only God can tell you what will happen tomorrow. So we human beings, we can guess. But to guess, we have a chance that we are wrong. And we must have the courage to be wrong, the courage to fail, the courage to make a mistake. And this courage, we must teach them since at the age of five months. If a child has been educated with the idea that whatever he does when it is wrong, I will forgive you and you will learn. So come on, go on, do the next mistake. Just be careful, my son. Never repeat the same mistake twice.
because the mistake is there for you to learn. But if you repeat always the same mistake, that means you, doesn't, you don't learn. So I would never repeat the same. Do as many mistakes as you want. And do them now that you are young. Because the older the, you get, the less mistakes you must make. Because the older you get, the wiser you should be. And a wise man is a man that made many mistakes in the past, but doesn't need to make them anymore. So if in life there are 400 mistakes you can do, once you have done 396, <laughs> you are considered as a wise man. How have you created a culture amongst your people, your teammates, that is so motivational that they will do anything for you, day or night? I just, it's, it's, it's extraordinary, the, the culture you've created within your organizations. The culture in my organization comes from my passion which I transmit. Passion never stays in your, in your body. Happiness, love, never stays just in your body. Why? Because it goes outside the body, through the eyes. It goes outside through the words. So a happy woman, a passionate man, when they sit somewhere or when they speak, the passion and love gets out of their body. Boom, boom, boom. And it's eventually invisible during the first hour. But after one year, everybody in the room starts to get a piece, a wave of this passion, of this love. So that is how I, that's my first act. The second act, I am generous with my people because I love people. And I love people means also I respect people. If I get up at 4 o'clock, do I ask my people to get up at 4? No! Don't ask other people what you can do. Ask other people what they can do. If I can do certain things because I'm a strong body, if I can uh, uh, work uh, 20 hours, Am I entitled to ask the same to others? No. I am entitled to ask to others what others can do. So you must always adapt. Ask people the maximum, maybe, but only what they can do. And certain people can work 12 hours, and other people like me can work 20. So ask to everybody. So individually, uh, you must, uh, for each individual, you must find what you can ask him. That creates an enormous difference in the atmosphere because people feel respected, people feel at ease. Nobody is too, there is not uh, too much demand for everybody. The demand goes up till what the person can do. Then come little things. Every Monday we change flowers. We have a budget for flowers. In many companies they would put the flowers at the reception. So when you enter into the company, ah, you see flowers. We put flowers in the workshops where the people are, my people. And flower is color, and color is hope. And this is why we change every Monday colors, to give hope to people, to give happiness. You give flowers for an anniversary, you give flowers for Valentine's Day. It's, a, it's the symbol of love, it's a symbol of color, it's a symbol of hope. So we give hope every Monday. All these little elements added one after the other one. And after 40 years, oh my goodness, you, you have people around yourself that will never leave you. And this is how we establish the culture. That's why I have the same people since ever. I have people that have started to work with me in 1974. I have people with me that started with me in 74. The Big Bang, that's an interesting word, Big Bang. Now the Big Bang, 
Hublot is fusion. It's the fusion between the tradition and the future. It's also the fusion between rubber and gold. But if you think, the past and the future can never meet, naturally. Because the past is yesterday and the future is tomorrow. How can they meet? They can never meet. Impossible to meet. But human beings can bring them together. Rubber and gold can never meet because first rubber is on the tree and gold is under earth. So they can never meet. But at Hublot, we brought those two materials together. And we said, but listen, where those two materials, the rubber of the tree and the gold of the mine, where those two materials at one stage of planet Earth together, except in our watch, and we had to admit, yes, these two materials were already together in one, and we are not the first to have married gold and rubber. So who was the first? Big Bang. Because in the Big Bang it was all was together. And then came the explosion. And gold said, listen, rubber son, I will now go back under the earth in South Africa. And rubber said, I will go on a tree. But maybe one day a human being will bring us together again. And we did it. So we said we're going to call this watch Big Bang. Then, and it came with risk, and that's exactly what we've been talking about. <laughs> that was a genius idea <laughs> yeah. to this day. Uh, lastly, we hear all about China. Everywhere you go, it's China's slow, China's not slow, China's China. What, what's your view of, of China? My view of China is that China, <laughs> they are... Uh, one billion and so many people living there. My view of China is that it's 1.2 or 1.4, they, they increase so quickly, I don't know how much they are now, but let's assume they are 1.4 billion Chinese. My idea is that these 1.4 billion Chinese, they, they will want to be like the Americans. And they would like to live like the Americans or the Europeans. And they will work hard to reach this. They will work, not like in France, 35 hours a week. They will work 100 hours a week to reach that level of the middle class. And if they one day, if one day, if the middle class develops, today you have the workers and you have the rich, or the entrepreneurs and the government. But the government wants the middle class to grow and the middle class to get all the advantages of the industry because the industry has to give back. The industry, for, uh, the, the concept is you work, you create value and you get a salary and you get richer and richer and you can buy a TV, you can buy a car and so on. So if this happens, we will have a middle class in China that will be big like one billion people. And if this happens, and it might happen in the next 20 years, then China will be all over the planet. I mean, because they have so many ch uh, children, so many inhabitants. America has been a strong country because people are geniuses, people are creative, people are entrepreneurs, people are free, people are Republicans. That gives America a huge potential. But also there are 250 million. Switzerland, we are 8 million. <laughs> so uh, uh, um, uh, China is 1.4. It's nearly seven times the numbers of Americans. So if you have seven times the numbers of Americans and they are as rich as the Americans, you can imagine what our business will become. So China is a huge future, huge potential, because they, have, they are going to develop uh, themselves. When an American shoemaker producing shoes has sent a salesman to Africa, the salesman came back 
and uh, the boss said, so, how much potential do we have in Africa? And the guy said, boss, potential in Africa? Zero. Why? Because nobody's wearing shoes. It was 75 years ago. The boss was not happy. He said, I fire you. That's not an answer. So he left. Another came, became sales director, and the boss has sent the uh, young sales director, go and look at Africa. I want, I want to know what we can do there. The second director came back and said, boss, in Africa, nobody is wearing shoes. We have huge potential because nobody has shoes. Imagine they start all to wear shoes. How many shoes are we going to sell? <laughs> That's China. Imagine. China is huge. Now, today everybody speaks of China because the little, little, little part of the Chinese are wealthy. But if a little part of Chinese are wealthy, it's already a, mil it's already a few millions. So they say today in China you have seven million millionaires. That's, <laughs> that's like if every Swiss would be a millionaire, more or less. So it's already a lot, but it's nothing compared to the future. So the future, we have to count on China with the future. I have no, there is no other, <laughs> no other way to see it. And then there will be, and then there will be uh, India, and then there will be Indonesia, and then there will be all the other countries, and then at the end will be Africa. The potential of this continent is huge because nobody wears shoes, for instance. So it's enormous. So when you are young, you know that for the next centuries, you have enough to do. There's enough potential. There's enough development. So there's all the reasons to be optimistic.